uh, halfway through this uh, series, so I want to welcome you guys. If you haven't been here for a couple weeks, we've started this series called Soul Activity. And you can see the bottom line says how to follow through on following Jesus. And so the whole the, the point of it all, guys, we want to encourage all of us, whether you've been a believer in Jesus Christ for a long time, whether it's been a while and you're just trying to kind of make your way back, or maybe you're just kind of curious to see what it's all about, or you're just still young, you're still trying to figure this all out and kind of growing into this. Uh, this is good for all of us because the idea is that when it comes to being a Christian, it is not something like what the uh, title video said. It's not something that we do for an hour and a half on a Sunday. Okay, it's actually something that we get to do every day. It's, it's following through on this idea of following Jesus. And we've been making this one point that believing is just the beginning. It's one really key point that we've been wanting to make. Believing is just the beginning. There is so much more to that. It's like me, you know, let's say for your birthday, right? And I'm going to give you a birthday gift, all right? Let's just say don't expect one because I don't know when everyone's birthday is and I can't afford it that bad, okay? So I wish. But <clears throat> let's just say I could. If I gave you a gift and you received that gift, I'm like, wow, thank you. That's awesome. But receiving that gift is only part of it, right? You get to open it, see what's inside, pull, you know, use it, whatever, wear it, whatever. I don't know what it would be. But there's more to it than just receiving a gift. Does that make sense? So that's the same thing. There's more to just believing. To receive, you know, to receive Jesus into your heart is more than just believing. It's important. Believing is just a beginning, but there's so much more to that prayer. Then there's this life that follows, much like a wedding, much like a marriage. Okay? A, good marriage is, uh, a good marriage is not determined by how good the vowels are. Okay? You know, those of you, if you've ever seen a wedding, right? The, the, you know, till death to us part from sickness and whatever. Some of you may have, uh, if you have parents that have gotten married, or maybe if you've gotten married, you maybe said somebody else's generic vowels, you wrote your own. I sang mine, okay? Killed it that day, okay? I sang him. Whatever. So now, now some of the guys are like, dang, bro, you make me look bad. And I was like, whatever. And so, you know, I got to do that. It was just cool. But see, as great as those vows are, that doesn't guarantee that the wedding's, that the marriage is going to be great, right? Because the service is over, but then the real work of the marriage starts. Same thing with God. When you invite Jesus into your heart, it's like that, you know, you guys become one. It's like the beginning of something. But then there's something that you follow through on. There's a life that is lived together, and it's a lifelong of learning and growing. And so that's what I want you guys to understand. It's just more than just a Sunday thing. It's, there's an everyday thing made available to us. And I want you to understand that because maybe you just think, well, maybe it's just a Sunday thing. But no, it's not. It's more than that. Because here's the thing, guys. Here's why I want to challenge you to follow Jesus because I believe with all my heart when you follow Jesus, you find life. When you follow Jesus, you find life. Right? You saw the, that video over there. It was like, could you relate to any of those people hitting that snooze button? By the way, w with the sign of your fingers and hands, how many times do you hit that snooze button? Okay? Two, three, four, five, all right, whatever. Some more than once, more than likely more than once, right? And so we all have those, right? We all have those little habits because, you know, I, I want to sleep a little more. And for some of us, maybe it's a little hard to get up in the next day. I know for students, it's really hard for students to get up right now because you're just a couple weeks out. You've been burned out from all the tests and stuff. Who remembers, by the way? Some of y'all are like, no, I blocked that out, right? That's just done. That, my, that, that was a long time ago, right? But some kids, right, they, they, they don't want to get up in the morning because they know, oh, i got to take another test. or oh, But, you know, you're excited because the summer's almost. Look, let me tell you, if the kids are excited, teachers are that much more excited. I know. I used to be, a, I've been 11 years teaching, nine years public and private schools, high school and middle school, two years at um, uh, homeschool co-ops. And look, this is what teachers look like before and after, at the beginning of the school year and after the school year. Okay, if we can put it up just so you can see, right? That's it. Okay, teachers at the beginning of the school year versus the end. Students too, right? Arash, you know, he's a university professor. Same thing, right? That's all of us right there. All right, we can put it away. But, uh, it, you know, it's hard to kind of get up in the morning. Maybe it's hard to follow through because I know you might be tired. You might have a lot going on. And you're like, man, the last thing I want to do right now is follow through with my commitment to follow Jesus. Sometimes I'm going to, I'll be honest, it's, you don't want to, right? You, <laughs> you don't want to forgive someone. You don't want to be nicey nice to someone. You don't want to love somebody. And there's those moments there. There's those moments there. But I want to challenge you guys, regardless if you're tired or not, or you're just curious or, or don't understand at all. There's so much more. When you follow Jesus, you find life. And Jesus actually told us, this is the one verse that we've been breaking down every single week. It's this one. We find it in Mark, where Jesus said the number one activity, the one activity you all should be busy doing is love. Here he said, the most important commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, all of that together, <coughs> all of that together, loving the God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor, that's all one thing, okay? To love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is to love him with everything of who you are. It is not just something that you do, again, on a weekend for like an hour and a half, okay, or five minutes before your day starts, or those 30 seconds before you pray for your meal, okay? There's so much more. There's so much more. He says, look, you love, you follow Jesus with this key word, love. That's how you follow God, love. Love has to be the motivation. Love has to be the key. It can't be an obligation. It has to be a decision, a willing decision. You don't have to, you get to, you want to. Right? And so last week we talked about how do you love, well, first off, we started with the Lord. That's why we highlighted that. It's not just loving God, but I want to say this one word. If you've never, we don't use it. To love the Lord is to recognize that, notice that he is, the Lord is one, meaning there is only one God, and God is, and the Lord is it. It's Jesus Christ. It's God himself. There's only one God, and there is no one else like him. That's when it says, uh, when he's describing it, there's no one else better, no one else that can compete, no one else that can compare. But also to declare that he is your Lord, there's a relationship there. Don't you notice? He is yours. Your Lord. There's a relationship. But when you call him Lord, that means that he's calling the shots, not you. Okay? He calls the shots in your life. You look to him as the one. When, when your marriage, the Lord should be calling the shots in your life, in your marriage. If you're not married, well, right now it's the Lord's calling the shots with your family. Okay? And you, with you specifically. He's the final decision. That's that idea. When you begin to grow and follow him as the Lord, not just some God that you believe in, but the Lord, your God. And we talked about last week <coughs> that you love him with all your heart. And your heart is your desires, your passions. Right? You got to want to love him. Thank you. Okay. You got I think I, I drank way too much coffee today and not enough, not enough water, so I'm all like dried out. And so you got to want to love him with all of your heart, which means you got to want to. Right? That's the desires, your passion. Okay? You want to want, you want to want to be with him and get to know him. All right? He doesn't want you to have to. He wants you to choose to. Right? It's a big decision. It's a big change right there. And today, though, we're going to focus on how to love the Lord your God with all your soul. Okay? And the soul, I mean, that is the core of who you are. Deep down, the real you, right? The stripped down version of you, not the, you know, superficial one, not the one that you have, you know, when you have the smile on your face when you don't have one behind that smile, right? And so the real, true you, the you that, that most people probably don't even know because we've gotten really good at putting up a, you know, outdoor version of you versus a true, true you. No, God says it, 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 the best way to do it. It's loving with and being truly honest to the core of who you are, okay? Just like we saw earlier with, it's, it might be hard to do that, um, you know, you might think it might be hard to follow Jesus every single day, but just like you saw earlier, you know, I know some people, maybe they have a little bit of struggle with the Sunday through Saturday grind, right? To try to find that, mean, you know, maybe Monday through Friday is a little pointless for you. Monday through Friday is just, you just got to put it up, you know, you got to put up with it. To get to the weekend, right? You live for the weekend and, and, and working for the weekend. And then you get that moment, those three weeks, right, or three days, and then back at it all over again. But with Jesus, guys, he offers us meaning and life for every single day of the week. Not just Sunday. Not just Sunday. Not just Friday. Not just whenever it is. No, he offers us meaning every single day of the week. And today we're going to talk about that. So we're going to lo- how to love the Lord your God with all your soul we're going to talk about it like this, is to love others more than yourself every day of the week, not just once a week. Now, can you tolerate that? Yes. Can you tolerate that? Now, that might be like, yes, no, no, no. You guys know what the word even tolerate means, okay? Some of us, I think we do and we don't. To tolerate something, right? To tolerate something, if, you, if you're married, you know what the word tolerate means, right? Whatever. And so, but look, to tolerate, right, is this. If you don't know what the word means, to tolerate is to say, look, I can handle about this much before I snap, okay? We all do it. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. We all do it. We can, we can take up to here, but then after that, I'm like, okay, enough. Done. Like, for example, I can tolerate a little Justin Bieber, okay? I can tolerate it a little bit. There's just certain songs I can tolerate. There's just others I'm like, turn it off. Shut it down. No. I was like, some I can tolerate, some I can't. I can tolerate hot dogs, okay? Meaning I can eat it, but after, like, my threshold is like two. For whatever reason, by three, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw up. Okay, I don't know why. So I can tolerate about two hot dogs all right, before it gets a little too much. You know, even me, I'm a little more patient with my kids or just in general. 
So uh, I have a certain tolerance level with kids either, you know, being disrespectful or annoying or I don't know, whatever. I have a certain tolerance level. My wife says, if I'm here, my wife's like, like there, okay? And so <coughs> it's fun. But, you know, I have certain tolerance levels with certain things. Does that, does that make sense with the idea of to tolerate means, right? It says, look, up to here, but then that's it. Now, it's, for some things, it's good to have a high tolerance level. For some, this is a little hard. I'm like, man, I can tolerate being nice to people on Sunday, but come Monday, but if I haven't had my coffee, don't talk to me, right, or whatever. And so it could be a little hard. It could be a little hard for some, but I want you to see, and, and I think we all can agree that um, the one thing that we should have zero tolerance for, okay, and that's, that's actually probably here at school, right? Zero tolerance means no excuse, okay? There's no, uh, you know, no mercy right here. We all, I think we all can agree that we all should have zero tolerance for people mistreating others. Would you agree? Like I say, yeah, that's, okay, I can't handle that. I can't see somebody talking bad about somebody, or I can't see someone mistreating someone else, okay? Zero tolerance, right? I mean, that's, that's a good thing to have. We don't want just to be one of those observers and somebody is being mistreated or ignored or hurt and we're just kind of like, not my business, right? And so, no, we should have zero tolerance towards people mistreating others, but especially, and this is the hard one that I'm going to challenge you today, we should have zero tolerance for ourselves and how we, we treat and mistreat others. And so when we talk about today that, the, that God can, I mean, that we can love the Lord our God with all of our soul, one way you can do that with the core of who you are is to put others before yourself, all right? And, be a king, and that's something that is hard to tolerate because there's a certain, you know, I can handle people to up to here, and then after that, myself come, you know, and it's, it's, it could be a little hard. And actually, today we're going to talk about something that could be a little controversial, okay? Because there's no, there's no clear-cut answer on this one, okay? And this is where people can have an issue with. And so we're going to talk about that, all right? Who's up for a little bit of controversy today? Okay, you all love a little controversy today? All right, let's see. First, let's go look at the Bible. This is what we're going to look at today. This is, uh, we're going to look at a Bible verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And Paul is trying to help these Christians to clarify some things, all right? So let's read it. All things are lawful. He's quoting something that is typical in this uh, Corinthian city that they would always say. It was just like a, you know, like a slogan people would usually say, especially the Christians. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Sounds a little bit like Jesus, right? To love others more than yourself. Seek other people's good more than yourself. Eat whatever is sold in the market without raising any question to the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and, and, and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions. Say these three words for me. On the ground of conscience. We're going to talk about that in a second. Let's go to the next one. Um, on the ground of conscience. He continues on and he says, but if someone says to you, this meal, this meat has been offered in sacrifices to an idol, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his. For, we should, for, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that which I give thanks? And then he wraps up with uh, something you saw earlier today with this Bible verse encouragement here. He says this, so whatever you eat and so whatever you drink and whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone and everything, I do. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Now, guys, I wanted to show you, I know there's a little bit in there, and there's some weird stuff in there that I want to kind of show you the point he's trying to make, because it actually applies to today. But if we can go to the first one, um, he's, he's been making this case now in the book of, uh, his letter to the Corinthian church, okay? Just so you know, um, the majority of the, the majority of what we have as books in the New Testament, those were letters that were written by individuals, like to give an account, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about uh, the life and testimony of Jesus. And then everything after that, outside of Acts, is pretty much letters that were written to specific people or to specific churches, this one being one of them, to the church in the city of Corinth, okay, which is around, you know, Greek, Greece and around that little area there of Asia Minor. And so he's trying to help them. He's been making this case. This is chapter 10. From all the way from chapter 8 to chapter 9 to chapter 10, he's been making this one case because he's trying to clarify something in this church, a problem that they have, 
okay? Notice here he says, all things are lawful. It's a phrase that they used to say. Because, see, when you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we, should, we told you if you find Jesus, you find life. And, see, what uh, we realized that all the law that God had given the, the, you know, in the Old Testament, okay, all of it was good. None of it was bad. There was a lot of stuff that just helped people to understand, look, here's how you interact with people. Here's this, here's that. But there was a lot of regulations. And these regulations, like dietary regulations, you weren't allowed to eat this or wear that, or you had to do this, you had to do that. It was little simple things that God was trying to teach these people how to live. By the way, the more we look at the law of God compared to, let's say, other laws that, you know, other traditions of the cultures have created, uh, God's law is actually pretty on point. You know, before, you know, the ideas of germs, you know, there was this, that's where, hey, don't touch dead things, don't touch open wounds, don't touch it. And so, you know, without science, it's hard to understand for them back then, 3,000 years ago, the idea of microscopic things. And so it's been really interesting. And, and even the diet that was created, you know, that in the law of God, this kosher kind of a diet, it's actually a really healthy one. It's pretty good. And so none of the things are bad. But now with Jesus, he said, hey, look, we have this new freedom. You don't have to worry about following every single rule because you can't. Okay? And so, like, you know, when it comes to what you're going to eat, what you're going to do, what you're going to do, you have more choices now. So I'm pretty sure some Jews, you know, their mind was blown when they had bacon for the first time, okay? And so that's pretty interesting. I would have loved to have been there. It would have been pretty cool. And so I was like, I've been missing this this whole time. How glorious. Bacon. This is amazing. So anyways, and so uh, with that, there was this debate. Because, see, the thing is, guys, he was saying, look, all things are lawful, meaning, hey, you guys got a lot more options on how to live. But not all things are helpful. Not all things build up. Because here was this argument. They kept on going back and forth, and the key word that he was trying to make this whole three weeks or three chapters was on the ground of conscience, okay? And if you don't know, one, if you don't know what the conscience is, guys, guess what? We all have one. You've all, you don't have to understand it to uh, be able to use it. You all naturally do. Your conscience is your ability to pretty much decide right and wrong. For example, have you ever heard of a, a guilty conscience, right? Have you ever had a guilty conscience? I'm pretty sure. If you don't know what I'm saying, it's like, have you ever done something wrong and immediately be like, yeah, oh, what was I doing? And you felt bad, right? You said something, did something, and you just, inside, you just knew that that wasn't right or that wasn't a good thing, you know? We all have those, you know? And my, my youngest, uh, no, one of my kids, uh, he has a problem with lying. And so, and he's, here's the thing, he's good at it. I mean, he'll look at you dead in the face and just straight out lie. And uh, my, my, my wife walked in on him. He did something, like, messed with this chart that he had, and she saw him do it. And he saw her see him do it, okay? And she still said, did you do it without blinking? Nope. Okay? Without blinking. And I was like, I didn't do it. And so then she, tried, she challenged him. She tried to, like, work on his conscience. And so she would do this. It was pretty genius. She said, look, just so you know, I know every time you lie to me. You know how I know? Because when you lie, your ears turn red. Now, they didn't, okay? They didn't. His ears didn't turn red. But she just threw that out there. It's like, I'll always know when you're lying to me because your ears will turn red every time you lie. She walked away. The next time it came up with an issue of lying, he, she, you know, he, did you make your bed this morning? Yes. Then why are your ears red? He goes, <gasps> like, he goes like this. His ears weren't red. She's just messing mind games, you know? She's just messing with him. But so he goes, why are your ears red? What? Are they? No. Oh, and so she's just messing around with him. It was genius. So it's this idea of, you know, guilty conscience. When you do something wrong, you know, you feel bad, right? That's, that's the guilty conscience. But we all have a conscience when it comes to right and wrong. You know, it's like, hey, is this, you know, what is right, what is wrong? And your conscience, is, guys, is a part of your soul. It's the core, deep down, your convictions on how you see things. Guys, you know, here in America, guys, I want to tell you something about, about especially our culture. No other country in the world outside of, outside of the, the Jews highlighted and, and amplified the idea of conscience than more than any other. I mean, it was so foundational. Like, when, if you would go back in the day to our founding and our founding era, they would speak of the ground of conscience more than anything. You know, saying, look, we ought not to be... I mean, that's why the pilgrims came here. Because they were not just told, hey, don't worship God like that. No, they were forced to through manipulation, through... Um, Oh, my gosh, what's the word uh, when they mutilate you through mutilation, okay? They would sometimes, you know, if, if you're not worshiping the way we tell you to worship, we cut off your ears, cut off your nose or whatever, we torture you. And they would. They would rob them. They would take their money and this and that to force them to worship God in the way that they determine instead of being free. <coughs> 
to be able to worship God in their own way like that. And so that's why the pilgrims came for that idea and for and to be able to establish themselves because they wanted to go back and make things better. But instead, they uh, made something pretty awesome here along with many others. But guys, I want you to understand that the ground of conscience was so important here in America. You guys know that we enshrined it in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights. Because guess what? If, if you, hopefully you, history, if you know anything about history, you ought to know our first Bill of Rights. We have the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. We can write anything. Freedom of association. I think I missed one. Okay, I don't know. One of those two. Right? And so what are all those freedoms? Did I miss one? Which one? Thank you. Okay, there you go. Freedom of, so freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. All of those, you know, those are all in Bill of Right number one. And you know what all of those are an example of? It is the right of conscience. Like if you believe in something, you can say it. You, can, you ought to have the freedom to be able to say it. If you believe in something, you ought to have the freedom to write about it and to declare. And declare. If, if you believe in something, you ought to have the right to meet with other people who believe the same thing. You can't. You know, that, that was the idea. You have the freedom to do these things. Now, you, don't, you didn't back then have the freedom to do whatever you wanted because even Thomas Jefferson said it really clearly. Look, as long as it doesn't break my leg or pick my pocket, I'm okay. Does that make sense? Like, look, you can believe whatever you want as long as your belief doesn't allow you to come steal from me or hurt me. No, no, see, that right there, you are exercising your freedoms to take away mine. You know, you're exercising your right to take away my rights. That is where the line doesn't cross. You can't impose, okay? But you know, guys, you know that's a Christian idea? There, that was, that's a Christian idea that, that, was in, that it was introduced and for the first time enshrined in the foundation of a country. That's why we have what we have here. It's why in such a short amount of time, you know, because we've had this freedom to argue, freedom to debate, freedom to discuss, freedom to explore, freedom to question, we were able to find so many things and develop so quickly over time. Even, the, you know, it's crazy that all of our universities were, all, by the way, all Christian universities. And they didn't force people. They were all Christian universities, but they didn't force you to believe in things. They didn't force you to believe in what they believed in. You could have disagreed. You could have argued against. And that was fine. They were up for it, okay? They were, Let's go, because in that, in that conversation, in when we challenge each other, we grow stronger. But how ironic that 200-something years later, the same institutions in America that have fostered freedom, the freedom of conscience, has now flipped on its head. And now those same Christian universities which champion conscience and freedom of thought aren't like that anymore. Where it's like, they, oh, it's, it's the complete opposite. We've come full circle. Where now, oh, if you don't believe in the right things we say, so then, okay, we, you can't work here, okay? You can't, you can't interact here. You can't assemble here. You can't, you know, if you're going to, now we see everybody when they come and and going to give a speech. Oh, if you disagree with the person who's giving a speech, then let's take his right away to speak. And that's, that's dangerous. You don't want that to happen on either side. Just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean that you can have the right to remove their right to speak. Because if you can do that to them, can't they do that for you? And who would want that? And so that we're having a little bit of an issue, especially here right now with our conscience. There's so many things that we're dealing with. But it was, it was an important thing, and it still is. But here's these two quick points I want to help you make, because I think what Paul's trying to say here. The one is this. You have the right to do what you want, but it doesn't mean that what you want to do is going to always be right. Okay? That's kind of the one point he's trying to make here. You have the right to do what you want to a certain extent, but it doesn't mean that what you want to do is always going to be right. And that's where you say, look, all things are lawful, not all things are helpful. Let no one seek. Here's the key, though. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of others. Again, it's coming back to and looping to love. And now there was this weird debate, I don't know if you kind of caught all those things about buying meat and the market and coming over to dinner, and if somebody gives you this, and hey, what was all that about? Okay, let me give you this one idea. There was debates back then on how Christians should live. Do we still have those today? You know, back then they were like, hey, Christians, could a Christian do this? Could a Christian listen to that? Could a Christian go here? Could a Christian do that? Do we still have those conversations today? Yeah, we still have arguments back and forth. You know, what, what should, should, should a Christian wear this or not? Can a Christian go to here? Can a Christian go to a party? Can a Christian not? Can a Christian eat certain food? Can a Christian not? Could a Christian, should a Christian worship on Sunday or worship on a different day? Could a Christian here's what, have, drink alcohol or not? You know, can a Christian dance or not? Right? There's all these back and forth. And have you ever gotten to an argument with one of those people on what you can and what you can't do? 
right? And it's back and forth, right? And so here, that's what they're having. That's the argument that they're having because, see, back then in, in the city of Corinth, this is not a Christian nation. It's, a, it's much like our culture today, very similar. And so uh, what would happen is a lot of them, anything you would go buy at a grocery store, it was really pagan nation, pagan city. So they would dedicate all this food to false gods. And then they would turn around and sell it at the market. And so there were some Christians that it bothered them. They were like, no, see, we shouldn't be eating these things because it was dedicated to a false god. And so it's wrong to eat it. It's wrong to buy it. It's wrong to do And so some abstained from meat altogether. They didn't want to. Others were like, bacon is good. Okay, no, I'm going to eat it. I don't care if they, de- I don't care if they you know, dedicated it to some god. Guess what? There is no god. There's no false god. They, just, they don't know what they're doing. It, there's nothing wrong with it. I can have it. No, you shouldn't. Yes, I can. No, I can't. And then there was arguments back and forth on what they ought to do and how they ought to interact. And, and so here, it's very much the same here. The, um, and the, the idea was this. Like, look, you have a right to do what you want, but it doesn't always mean that it could be right. And so he was trying to get them to understand, look, let's say you're together and you're having a conversation. Let's say you go out to dinner. And, one, and let's say you're with, with one of these people that doesn't like the meat, can't order the meat because it's it, you know, it goes against their convictions. Maybe it brings them to this place where they remember sacrificing stuff to that God. And so to eat a, ste- to eat a bite of a steak brings them back to the time when they were worshiping a false God and they don't want that. And so, okay. So the idea is they're saying, well, look, if somebody has an issue with that and you might be fine, you can eat that and you can do whatever and it's not bothering you. It doesn't hurt your relationship with God. Even though there's nothing wrong with it, think of the other person and maybe order fish that day. You know, it's kind of the idea. You know, think of someone else. Think of someone else. If it really would bother them or, or, or you know, have an issue, is it really that big of a deal that you have steak that day? You know, or is it really big of a deal? No, just try something else. And so that's a little bit of what he was trying to say. Because to be able to say, look, man, whatever, I'm going to do it. And then you can have, even now with brothers, a little bit of a conflict, right? A little bit of an argument. And that's not, even though you're doing something that you believe is right, that's not the right thing to do. You're not helping. You're not helpful at that moment. Or let me give you another one. Let's just say, because alcohol is one that's a big deal. Should Christians drink alcohol? You know, it's, it's one of those things where if you look in the Bible, by the way, if you look at a lot of stuff in the Bible, there are things that are clear as can be, and there should be no argument there. If it is in the Bible and God, meaning in God's word, he has declared it in his word. If it is consistent from beginning to end, if it is there, and, it, and then God has already spoken on the issue. So, for example, is there, will there, should there ever be a debate on should Christians murder or not? Okay? No. Okay? God called it. One of the ten. Ten commandments. Okay? Is, should there ever be a debate if stealing is right or wrong? No, God already called it. You know, sleeping with somebody that's not your wife, having sex before marriage, is that, can we call that? Yeah, okay, God called it. All those things, God called it. You know, lying, um, um, all those stuff, holding unforgiveness, can do yes or no. Of course, God called it. So all of these things that have been declared in the word of God, those are not up for debate. If God has already made a decision on the specifics, then that's it, okay? Is this lifestyle a right one or not? No, okay? That's one of the things. That's, that's why for, for some I know it's hard, even with the idea with, you know, our culture today with, uh, with life choices and, and, you know, now with the ideas of uh, just being gender fluid, right, or, 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 or all that other stuff. And, and when you have these ideas of homosexuality and feelings, like, look, God called it. Man and woman. He created man and woman. That's how it is. And so God made the decision. Don't shoot the messenger. Okay, kind of whatever kind of a thing. He called it. He's made a choice. He's made a decision. He's declared what it is. Homosexuality, the same thing. He's declared it. And so when you say those things, see, God has declared, but what else? After that, there's a lot of like, okay, now what? It's like gray areas, you know? By the way, on alcohol, what, has God called it? Yep. He's, it's clear, and this is all we know. Getting drunk's not a good thing, okay? Don't do it, okay? That's right there. Getting drunk is, but then guess what's not in the Bible? Do you have a sip or two or not? It's not there. And so now what do you do? Because some people have a certain mm, over here, and some people are like, mm, well, hey, whatever, okay? And so... It's, it's in the middle there. And so guess what you do? And this is what Paul is saying. If it is not clear, you default. Here's the default decision. If it's not clear, love. Thinking of someone else. Okay, for example, clothes. Okay, I'll give you that one. All right, girls, let's say, because there's all, you know, how much, how many inches, right, above the knee or whatever can you wear. And so if you're trying, like, you know, here's the default. That's not in the Bible. So the default is, I would ask you, if you want to wear something, then if it's questionable, 
uh, why do you want to wear it? You want to, you know, because, you know, to get the attention of someone else? Okay, maybe that's not the right, maybe that's not the best thing to do. Or you, you see, you know, little things like that. It's where's the motivation behind it? What's your motivation behind certain things? Same thing with, with the other, like, do you want to have a drink or just, does the drink have you? Right? That's a, that's a difference there. And so that's the idea is back and forth, even with the dancing, with all that stuff. It's like, look, your default decision ought to be love. And it ought to be what's your motivation behind it. And, but then back and forth. But when you bump up against someone, what happens is a different conviction. Let's just say I know people that was like, look, I know Christians that say Christians shouldn't have a sip of anything. And they have a strong conviction. You know why? Because they probably had had a history of, fam maybe they had a family history in their life where it's like, man, alcohol has destroyed their family. And so I'm like, I'm not going to touch it. I don't need it, okay, which uh, you shouldn't. If you need it, there's a problem. If you need anything, uh, you know, sugar, okay, there's a problem, but whatever. And so and there might be somebody that has a strong conviction why. And so if you're on the other side, and I'm like, well, look, uh, my family's never had those issues. We've always, you know, my parents always had maybe a glass of wine here for dinner, and maybe a little thing every once in a while, but it never got out of crazy, never got out of control. And then if there's a debate back and forth, then you ought not to, one, force the other or guilt trip the other or trying to make this point to kind of like destroy the other person's arguments because is there love there? There isn't. Okay, unfortunately, our culture today, there's, there, we don't, you know, our, the debate on being able to listen to one another is, is not, we're not really good at that, you know. But here he's trying to say, look, even though you might, you might feel okay doing it, maybe don't do it if the, if the moment is wrong or if the situation is wrong. Meaning, hey, if maybe you, you, you might, it might be okay to do this, but maybe you don't want to do it in the moment because someone else might think something, and especially a non-believer, and then that might, that might hurt. Another thing is this, and I love this one, uh, this uh, great thinker, Ravi Zacharias, said this. He's like, you might have, and I think Paul's making the same case here, you have all the right to believe in something, but just because you believe it doesn't mean it makes it right. I'm going to say that again, okay? Just because you have the right to believe in something doesn't mean that what you believe is right, okay? Here's, and there, that should be for all of us, a little bit of humility, too. Because here, what if you have a strong conviction of something and someone else has a different kind of conviction? But what if you just grow up to a certain extent, you be like, you know what? Before I used to do this and it never bothered me. It never bothered my relationship with God. It never got in the way of my relationship with God. But for whatever reason, now it is. So what do you do? Well, now you don't do it, right? Then you cut it. Why? Because you do it for you, but you do it for God. And so, see, there's, for some people, that's why you, we ought to love each other. That's what Paul is trying to encourage. You seek the other person's good. Don't raise any questions on, you know, what not. Try, don't make an issue where there's no issue. Let there always be love. And if you feel, if you're having an argument, especially with a fellow believer on the uh, grounds of conviction, or even a non-believer on the grounds of conviction and in conscience, you don't want to guilt trip them. You don't want to force them. You don't want to try to attack them and debate them for the sake of debating. No, the idea is you, 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 you use love as your motivation because maybe in that love you will guide and encourage them along that path and along that journey. I mean, wouldn't we as a believer want people to come and to, to realize what is right and true? And you, you're going to beat that over the head with them? Is that going to work that way? No, you can't. You know, that's not going to work like that. You ought to, love is the greatest motivator and the greatest encouragement. And so if you ever bump into somebody, guys, with a little bit of, hey, should Christians do this and do that? Well, I would ask you, is it in the Bible? Does the Bible say anything about that? Well, no. So then what do you do? Just default to love. Guess what? You might not agree with each other, but could you still be respectful towards one another? Guys, look. We need to get good at that. The church needs to get better at that because you know what? Our culture is not at all. I mean, our culture, the idea of tolerance is not, okay, I can tolerate it this much, but, you know, I, meaning that I don't necessarily like it. Like, I'll give you something else I can tolerate. I can tolerate fish, okay? Uh, my wife is a great cook. She cooks fish pretty good compared to most places that I go to, but I just don't, I just can't enjoy it like I do bacon. Do you know that I love bacon? I mean, have you figured that out by now? Okay. I just can't enjoy it the same way. And so I'll eat fish, but it's just not, I'm not just like, mm, I'm not excited. I'll, I'll do it because I know it's healthy. It's good for me. Okay, but I can tolerate fish. Like, I'll eat it and be fine. I can tolerate vegetables. I'll eat it. I won't enjoy it, but I'll eat it. But our culture, the idea of tolerance has been flipped on its head. Because now the idea of tolerance is not just, can you handle it? Can you deal with this? But no, it's, hey, 
um, I need you to accept this. I need you to enjoy this. I need you to endorse this. I need you to celebrate this. I need you to fund this, okay? That's the idea, and that's completely to the extreme because that's, that's kind of what Paul's trying to tell him to do. You can't force your conscience on someone else. And by the way, I know some might complain and say, oh, Christians, you're so intolerant, right? Which their, their, their level of tolerance is insanely intolerant because they'll say to us, I'm like, oh, Christians are so intolerant. Why don't you accept the, my lifestyle? Why don't you believe in this? Or why don't you celebrate this? Why can't you? Do you ever hear a Christian throw that argument back at them? Well, how come you're so intolerant, Mr. Because, oh, you don't accept Jesus and you can't, don't believe in me and you don't endorse what I believe? Oh, how dare you? Do we throw that back at their faces? No. And so that's, 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 I want, that's why guys love ought to be our motivator because they don't even see the hypocrisy in their own arguments. They don't even see how, how they are. This is the world's, by the way, the golden rule. You ever heard of the golden rule by Jesus? Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? Meaning you're respectful towards others. You respect others. You love others. You treat others well. Now, uh, let me ask you a question. Just because you respect others, does that I'll guarantee you will always be respected? Jesus didn't say that. Just because you treat others well, does that mean that you'll always be treated well? No. But the idea is, look, all you can control is yourself. And when Jesus says this is love, to treat others the way you want to be treated, especially when people don't treat you the same way, that's love. That's the power of God to be able to do that. That's the golden rule. Our world has a fake golden rule. Okay, you know, like fake gold. You know, it looks real, looks shiny, but there's no substance to it. The fake golden rule is not, the Christian rule is, the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. The world's fake golden rule is, treat others the way they treat you. Treat others the way they treat you. Meaning, because people have been disrespectful to you, you're going to be disrespectful to them. Meaning, if people mistreat you, you're going to mistreat them. People cheat on you, you're going to cheat on them. People lie to you, you're going to lie to them. That's the fake golden rule. And there's no substance there. Guys, and, and, and I love the way this one pastor put it. Why would you want to get even with someone that you don't even like? Why would you want to get even with someone? Waste energy, waste focus, waste your life on trying to get even with someone that you don't even like, that you don't even want to be with, that you don't even want in your life. Why that effort wasted? Now, there's no effort wasted when you love others the way that you would want them to treat you. You know, you can make a difference in that way. And that's what Paul's trying to say. And for us, guys, when it comes to our soul activity, how do we follow Jesus? Well, let me give you a default because it's all not all clear, is it? There's a lot of vague stuff. Can a, can a Jesus follower eat this? Can a Jesus follower drink that? Can a Jesus follower go here? Can a Jesus follower do that, do this? And you're going to bump into people who have different views and opinions on that. Some versus the things that God has declared. Others that are kind of gray. And what happens when you do? You ought to always default to love. Always default to love. Regardless, of that, you might disagree with that, or okay, hey, but can we still treat one another well? Can we, can we still agree and disagree, but really mean it? Not one of those, okay, let's agree to disagree. Okay, and that's, okay, now you're just being rude and sarcastic, okay? No, no, but truly, like, I can, I, and, and, and I, this really meant a lot to me, because I had some family and friends um, that their lifestyle choices aren't, they know I don't agree with, they know that I, as a believer, as a pastor, uh, I would say God does, has not given an okay on that. And um, one of the things that I love is that, it, I mean, it made my day when they told me this. It's like, look, I want to tell you something. It's like, they were half drunk when they said this, but whatever, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count. It counts, okay? It counts, it counts. And they told me, I was like, look, I just want to say, um, I know that you don't necessarily agree with everything that I do or believe in, in the same things I believe in. But the one thing that matters the most to me is that despite it all, you still look at me like a person and you still talk to me like a person. And I just want to say how much that matters. And I, now I'm not saying that to, you know, give me a little hand clap. I don't, okay? But it meant a lot to me. It's like, wow, see, that's what's better? For someone to, maybe there's a disagreement, but they still feel that love? Or just for you to make your case and, bah, you know, and just you, you feel better about yourself because you're right or think you're right, you know? Guys, love ought to be, when it comes to following Jesus, love and putting others, you love the Lord with all your God, you love your uh, Lord your God with all your soul, and you put others before yourself. That makes a difference. That, that adds meaning to every single day of your life, regardless when you're tired, regardless if you're exhausted, regardless if you enjoy your work or not. But when you put others first, that adds meaning to 
everything because there's love there. And the love of God gives you purpose. And so everything you do, he actually noticed, he said at the very end, so look, whatever you do, this is what you decide on. Whatever you do, even if you eat whatever you drink, do it for God's glory. Guess who you're not doing it for? You're not doing it for yourself. Okay, I know, hey, kids, let me tell you right now, some of you, you might, maybe there's certain things that you might do, and your parents will be like, you to them, will look like, I don't see anything wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with playing this game. There's nothing wrong with me doing that. There's nothing wrong with me uh, eating this. There's nothing wrong with me drinking this. There's nothing wrong with me going here. You might have that idea. And let's say you're right. Let's just give you, I'm going to give it to you. Let's say, okay, let's say, yeah, you're probably right. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing to that specific thing. But if, if your parents say, look, but I, I know, but for me it is, and I don't want you to do it. The default, you put others before yours. And that might be a small sacrifice. You may be like, ugh, got to be kidding. But I'm telling you, your life's going to be a whole lot better. Your, your, your relationship, your life, you're going to be, you're not going to miss out on anything. You're going to have more meaning. And that, guys, that goes for all of us. That goes for all of us when we do those things. If you don't see and you don't understand or, or whatever it is, if you do it not for your glory, that's what, hey, well, can a Christian have, you know, take certain substances, right? Alcoholic, drugs, and this and that. Okay, well, are you doing it for his glory or yours? Are you doing it for your own? Are you trying to get something and you're trying to replace God with that? Then uh, that's a problem. For sure, that's a problem right there. If you, if you run to something else other than God consistently, that's a problem. And that could be as simple as TV and entertainment and your phone, by the way. If you're quick to answer your notifications more than you are answering God's impressions on your heart, okay, you, you have, God has competition for your attention. And so there's more to it than that. And here he says, so honestly, when he says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And so I'm going to rephrase that. Say, everything you do, I want you to see it this way, is an opportunity to showcase what God has done. Everything you do is an opportunity to showcase what God has done. And why did Paul say, why should we live like this? Why should my freedom be dictated by someone's conscience? Why should my liberty to choose and enjoy and to be thankful for certain things, why ought to that be second to someone else's opinion? Why? Because he said, so hopefully people will get saved. You know, he said this one idea too. He says, look, I'm going to try to please everybody. I try and please everybody. Have you ever heard of someone say, you can never please everyone? Is that true? Yes. So why is Paul saying, my goal is to please everyone, knowing that's impossible? Just because it's impossible doesn't mean that he's not going to try. And that's his goal. He's like, look, I know it's impossible, but I'm going to do it anyways because that's the right thing to do. That's my conviction. I'd rather give up something that's not that big of a deal. And maybe to me, I can do it. I can drink this. I can go here. I can do that. And it doesn't affect my relationship with God. But if it can help, if I can give this up so that someone can find life, that's a worthy trade. That's a worthy trade. And uh, speaking of, there's a movie. Some, uh, some have arguments, hey, should Christians go to movies? Should a Christian see a rated R movie? Okay, I saw a rated R movie. Okay, um, now I'm not telling you you can or not, it's your conviction. But I saw one um, called uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Some of you guys might have seen it, some of you guys might have not. Hacksaw Ridge is a story made by Mel Gibson. And Mel Gibson kind of broke some rules because someone say, hey, should Christians, should Christian directors put on R rated movies? And some won't. Depends on the motivation. Depends on are you, what you're trying to build up. Are you just trying to glorify gore and guts for the glory of it all or for some other purpose? And Mel Gibson pushed the limits. I mean, this is a very gory movie. If, if you don't have the stomach for blood and literally guts and intestines all flying around, guarantee you I try not to watch it. It's really intense. But I watched it because it was a story of a man named Private Dawes. And see, Dawes, the whole movie was about conscience. The whole movie was about conviction. And see, Private Dawes lived back during World War II. And he, had, he was, had a strong conviction. I want to serve in the military. And he saw his father had served in World War I and the damaging effects that it had done mentally, emotionally on him. He saw what it was like, but he had a strong conviction. I have to serve. For me to stay home is wrong. Okay? I can't do that. But I, I choose to. You know, here in America, we have a rule that if you feel strongly, you know, I do not, because of religious purposes, I cannot serve in the army. Do you know that we can't force you to do that here? We can't. But for him, that's a different conviction. But his conviction was, I can't stay. I need to go. And so he went. But thing is that he also had another conviction. He didn't want to touch a gun. That's another argument. Should Christians carry firearms or not, right? Should they? Should they not? Should they own a gun at the home? Should they not? Is that trusting? Is that showing lack of faith in God by having a gun? Whatever. Hey, if you don't, if you have different convictions, 
That's, you know, if you don't like guns and you have a Christian friend that does, agree to disagree, but hopefully something goes down, be grateful if he's near, okay, because at least he's packing, all right, and he can help you. But anyways, um, the idea was he had a strong conviction. I can't touch a gun. Now, I'm not going to give this away, but in the movie, it reveals a traumatic moment in his life when from there, from then on out, he made a decision. I'm never going to touch a gun again. So there's a reason. So guys, be, be patient and, and, be, and loving with others because you don't know where those convictions have come from. You don't know what they have gone through that has made them choose to live like this. So be, be gracious. So he made a strong conviction. I'm not going to touch a gun. And he went through a lot because his division, they tried to kick him out of the army because he's saying, how are you going to help us? You're not helping us. If we're being shot at, you can't shoot back. You are a waste of a body in this group. You are going to kill us. And so many of his own um, division, his own, uh, the, the members in the military, you know, the, the people that it was in the barracks with him, they would uh, ridicule him. They would abuse him. They would hurt him. They would, they, I mean, they did everything possible to drive him away to get him to quit. And you know what Private Dawes, he, he took the beatings, the verbal and the physical beatings and kept going and kept going because he had a strong conviction. It's like, I'm going to serve. He actually would say, like, look, I see this whole world pulling itself apart. I don't see why it's wrong for somebody to just want to put it all together. And that was his motivation. And so he says, look, I don't want to fight. That's not my idea. I want to go be a medic. I want to serve. I want to save lives. I don't want to take lives. That's my conviction. That's what I want to do. And all the way to the end, he was seen as a waste, abused and ridiculed and whatnot, until one day he was up on this ridge called Hacksaw where they had to go fight and claim it from the Japanese. And there through a very, very bloody battle scene, his army, his troop, okay, his division retreated and he stayed behind because here he was in that whole first battle. He didn't know what to do. He's there. Everyone's shooting at him. He can't shoot back. So what's the idea? Why am I here? And he would argue with God. I was like, what am I doing here? Tell me, just tell me, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And in the faint, a faint voice he heard in the background saying, help me. And he heard, that was God helping him to hear that voice. And he was saying, that's what I want you to do. Go help him. So he went out throughout the whole night, recovering, going to every wounded individual, you know, stealth mode, trying to not be. He would take as many over and at one by one by one, dragging them over to the ledge, bringing them to safety, saving lives. Now, he wouldn't have been there if he would have retreated like everyone else. He wouldn't have been at that moment if he thought his role was to take a life rather than save it. But because of his conviction, he was placed at a prime moment in history at this point. And all night, he would just pray this prayer, give me one more, God, give me one more, God, give me one more, give me one more. At the end of the night, they couldn't believe what they had saw when the, when the troops came back. Here is an, a large amount of people that they thought were dead, should have died, but they never did because Private Dawes didn't give up. He brought them, and you know what? There was even uh, wounded Japanese soldiers. The enemy, he even saved them as well and brought them down. And in the end, before, when they thought this guy was a waste of space, a waste of breath, a waste of a uniform, because of his convictions, because he was willing to lay down his life and to do what he believed was right, he saved a lot of lives because he did those things. And now there's a lot of people today, a lot of great, great grandbabies that are still, that are alive today. Because one man chose to put others before himself and to do the right thing, even though everyone told him he was wrong. Everyone told him he was stupid for not wanting to carry a weapon and carry a gun. But he knew it was the right thing to do because that's what the Holy Spirit had put a conviction on his heart to do. That is an example of doing the right thing. Just like Paul was saying, and give, gave meaning to a, mo a pointless moment and gave meaning to it. And many, many people, many people found new life and have a future and a hope today because he put others first. And guys, that's, that's the motivation. That's why I'm saying, why would we give up something that maybe I can do this and it doesn't bother me? You know, if, as long as it's not robbing time from you or causing you to not follow Jesus or live like Jesus, if something is causing you to act like and talk like a demon rather than Jesus, then yeah, you need, you need to chill out with that. Okay, if it's not building you up, then it's not. You're wasting space. But besides that, why should you give up all these things, even things that are okay, so that God can do something great, so that God can do something amazing? I mean, again, guys, our culture is really good at ripping itself apart. 
Would you agree with me that wouldn't it be nice if there were some people that were willing to put it together and be willing to kind of put more of it back together again? Guys, could the church be that? Could our church be that? If we can focus on getting past, even though, look, I don't have to accept you. I don't have to accept that lifestyle, but I can still eat dinner with you. I can still talk to you like a person. I can still treat you with love and respect regardless. Do you think that the world, do you think the world, our community would be a better place if we had more of us being willing to put it back together again? I think it would. And by doing that, that gives other people, guys, a picture of Jesus. Because what did Paul end up saying? Hey, copy me. Be an imitator of me like I am trying to imitate. Did you catch that? Jesus. Imitate me. Be like this because guess who I'm trying to be like? Jesus. Now, let me ask you, did Jesus ever surrender his rights or his ability to do something that was okay and right to do? Did he ever? Is there ever a circumstance in history that we can look back that he gave up his rights in order for someone else to be saved? He did. See, Jesus, if anyone had, if, if anyone had the right to be comfortable, it was him. But he gave up the right to be in heaven, to come down to earth. Jesus gave up the right. As the king of the universe, he gave up his rights in order to be born in a feeding trough. Okay? He gave up every right that he had to honor and respect and love to come here to be mistreated and abused and ridiculed and even murdered. Jesus gave up every right possible, even things that were okay. He didn't pursue a family because he had a mission. He had a purpose. There was nothing wrong with getting married and having a family, but he chose not to do it for a greater purpose. He chose not to do a lot of things for, for a greater purpose, and that purpose was you and me. He gave up every single right so that you and I could be saved. And for me, if that's what it takes, then you know what? It's worth it giving up certain things or not doing certain things or getting into an argument for what? Paul says, don't give an offense. And I'll end with this last this phrase here because when I think of when he said in this verse, can I actually show it up when he says, you know, so whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Don't give an offense, not to Jews or Greek or whether it be cultural or anything else. When I, when I, I read that word, um, he said this, I, don't give offense. I thought of the word offense. It says give no offense. I thought of the word offense. See, offense, what's the purpose of offense in sports? They score points. Okay, what's the purpose of defense? To keep the offense from scoring points. That's how you win. But see, the idea with offense is here's the, we, we can't be consumed with, with who's winning. Do you want to win an argument or do you want to win a person? Do you want to win an argument or do you want to win a person? That's what he's trying to say. He's like, look, don't, don't, let's just not try to keep score here. You know, God, God won. Game's over. Jesus won. So let's just love and help them to see and experience the same thing. And again, guys, we have, a lot of, we have a lot in this world that's pulling it all together. I don't see why we can't have more of us be willing to put some of it back. Guys, I want to pray. Let's, let's wrap up. I want to encourage you today. God, I want to thank you so much, God, for, for your love and everything that you've done for us. God, um, I thank you that we were singing earlier today. Like, we just, you're just not good. You are too good to us.